this is a, a session uh, which I've entitled why we shouldn't be reverse snobs about opera because I have I have come across that uh, a lot on the left actually that you know opera is oh that's for posh people you know and it is expensive to go to the opera etc but that I don't think is the the main reason lots of many working class people perhaps don't do it it is it tends to be a seen as a quite a posh and you know nothing to do with me when it was quite different in in the past and was quite a working class um uh, time a uh, uh, leisure time to to go to the opera and uh, and experience that so we're very pleased to have with us uh, agnes corey who's the founder director of bella bartok center for musicianship and she's actually uh, got a phd in musicology so thank you very much for joining us agnes over to you Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, all good. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, just a um, couple of comments before I start my presentation. Um, I was interested to hear that Mark Fisher was a music critic, because although I didn't tell you, Tina, um, I am a very enthusiastic and committed voluntary music critic. I've been doing that since 2006. The other thing which um, um, struck me as interesting that Paul, I think Paul quoted someone, I'm not sure whom, that it's easier to imagine the end of world than the end of capitalism. So that's very interesting because at the end of my presentation, which is going to be my last music example, we're going to see either the end of world or end of capitalism, and it's going to be up to you to decide which one it is. So now I'm so sorry, but I need to put on my light because it turned really. Oh. That is it. Good t shirt. Ah. Is your light broken? Oh. Okay, so does this bother anybody? No, good. It's good. Yeah. Because otherwise I can't see my text. So thank you so much. Now, this title, Why Socialists Shouldn't Be Reverse Snobs About the Opera, it doesn't come from me. Um, I was surprised to see that there could be a presentation on such a topic. As I am passionate about music, including opera, as well as about socialism and politics in general, I volunteer to put forward my ideas. So, to avoid any misunderstanding, I am a lifelong socialist and a lifelong passionate opera and music lover. Admittedly, opera is an expensive genre, so attending opera performances is a lot easier for moneyed people than for those struggling to survive. Also, to a large degree, opera attendance is often a manifestation of riches, that is meeting of the mighty. Many of the rich and powerful attend to be seen rather than for any musical and theatrical interest. However, in most opera houses, there are, at least there used to be, very cheap places for those willing to stand or be placed on the top floor of the auditorium. Until 20 years ago, I stood through many performances of even particularly long operas at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. I should add, that in my childhood and teenage years in communist Hungary, opera and concert tickets were very cheap for any income, as were also books and other manifestations of culture. In Europe, the genre of opera was created in the late 16th century in Florence by a small group of artists, statesmen, statesmen, writers, and musicians known as the Florentine Camerata. They understanding of the probably powerful role of music in Greek tragedy inspired this late 16th century 
Florentine intellectuals to establish the genre of opera. They decided to recreate the storytelling of Greek drama through music. However, genres of musical drama were cultivated long before the 16th century in Japan, China, and South Asia. The first European opera we know about was Paris Daphne, composed in 1597, while the first surviving European opera was Paris Eurydice of 1600. 16,000, However, the first universally appreciated opera was Orfeo by the astonishing great composer Monteverdi. Orfeo was written for and performed for an exclusive audience at the Duke of Mantua's court, where Monteverdi was employed in 1607. However, 30 years after Orfeo, the first public opera house was opened in Venice, thus bringing opera to a much wider audience. It was here, at the Teatro San Cassiano, that Monteverdi's Coronation of Popper was performed during the carnival in 1643. Opera plots deal with ancient Greek heroes, gods, kings, queens, and so on. But they also deal with the struggle between upper and lower classes, the oppressor and the oppressed, the devastation of poverty, and the corrupting influence of undue riches and power. And they also portray tensions and tragedies within rural and urban communities of various kinds. Apart from Wagner, who himself wrote the liberty of most of his operas, opera composers set the music to other people's lyrics. However, composers do have the freedom to choose or accept texts and, crucially, they have the power to manipulate music as they wish. There are great many operatic examples which should encourage socialists to investigate and hopefully enjoy. An early example is the three beggars opera, an operatic satire written in 1728 by John Gay, with music arranged by Johann Christoph Pepusch. This operatic satire was adapted and premiered 200 years later in 1928 as the threepenny opera the Dreigotian Oper, with text by Bertolt Brecht and music by Kurt Weill. There are several operas which deserve socialist attention. Business Carmen, 1875, delves into the lives and loves of factory workers, soldiers, robbers, muggers, and the like. However, primarily, this is an outsider opera with Carmen trying to escape from the monotony of working life in a cigarette factory. Puccini shows party in La Bohème, 1896, an emotional exploitation by a representative of American imperialism in Madame Butterfly, 1904, while in the Rake's Progress, 1951, based on William Hoggart's engravings of 1732-33, Librettist Oden and composer Stravinsky portray corruption and destruction caused by riches. We should further consider operas by, for instance, Janacek, Berg, Britain, and others. But let me provide some examples by Mozart, Beethoven, and Wagner. The character of servant Figaro was created by Beaumarchais for his Figaro trilogy. The first of the three plays was The Barber of Seville, 1775, 
which was the basis of Rossini's opera Il Babier di Sevilla, 1816. The second of Beaumarchais' trilogy was The Marriage of Figaro. Written in 1778, just years before the French Revolution, the prayer reflected the growing, dissatisf uh, growing dissatisfaction with the ruling class and was considered scandalous at the time, both due to its depiction of incompetent and hedonistic noblemen being outwitted by his servant. Lorenzo da Ponte, Mozart's librettist for the operatic version of 1786, apparently toned down the political passages of the play, but Mozart's music leaves no doubt about the moral context. Interestingly, the roles of master and servant, that is the Count and Figaro, are both written for baritone voices, while the roles for the other pair, the Countess and her servant Susanna, are both for soprano voices. The latter duet from Act 3, Scene 10 of Marriage of Figaro, allocates similar musical lines to both soprano roles, thus implying full equality between them. Tina, can we please have the letter aria? Thank you, Tina. Um, this example comes from the Metropolitan Opera House, New York. And I really do think that there was no question here that the Countess and the servant were totally equal. Now, Beethoven. Um, 
Beethoven's Fidelio, 1805, originally titled Leonora or the, the Triumph der Ehrlichen Liebe, had the input of five librettists. Inspired on a supposedly real incident during the French Revolution, in 1789, Boyle wrote the French text, Leonora, and I can't pronounce the rest. Joseph Sonlenter made a German translation. Emmanuel Schikaneder commissioned the opera in 1803, and Beethoven's friend Stefan from Browning contributed to the text. And George Friedrich Dreschke made the final version. The plot is about a heroic wife Rescuing, rescuing her unjustly imprisoned husband. Hopefully, one day, someone will write an opera about Stella and Julian Assange as well. But Beethoven's sympathy with the oppressed goes beyond the unjustly imprisoned husband. The Prisoner Chorus is a moving musical realization of the horror of being kept in dark prison cells and the longing for light and justice. The Beethoven example, Tina, please.
Thank you so much, Tina. Um, this example um, came from a performance of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. And now to Wagner. Wagner's monumental ring cycle is arguable about the evils of capitalism, which destroys the world. Loosely based on characters from Germanic heroic legends, such as the Nibelungen lead, Wagner created the huge cycle, including text, music, and dramatic instructions by himself. In addition, he also organized the building of a special opera house, that is the Festspielhaus in Bayreuth for the project. At the beginning of the Ring of the Nibelung, written between 1869 and 1876, the dwarf Alberich steals the mermaid's hoard of gold, and from some of it makes a powerful ring which rules all the world. When the god Wotan steals the ring from Alberich, the dwarf puts a curse on it. During the four opera cycle, lasting some 15 hours, there is plenty of love, intrigue, and greed. But arguably, the most powerful thread throughout is the person of the powerful ring, which causes all owners, whether gods, giants, dwarves, or humans, to die. The cycle concludes with Brunhilda, the last owner, returning the ring to the Rhine maidens, the mermaids, and setting fire to the world, thus ending capitalism. Before we listen to the concluding immolation scene, or part of it, where Brunhilde sets her world to fire and returns the gold to nature, I would like to draw attention to Bernard Shaw's The Perfect Wagnerite. The fourth edition was published in 1929, but it was very successful, and there were several editions in 1898, 1902, 1913, 1923, and then reprint in 1926 and 1929. In his 155-page book, Shaw provides detailed analysis of Wagner's ring and leads it back to Wagner's revolutionary ideas 1848. Shaw proposes that the picture portrayed in Alberich's kingdom is unregulated industrial capitalism as described by Engels. Shaw comments that although Wagner uses stagecraft by making Alberich's initial curse important, it is not necessary, it's not needed. Because, quote, the ruin to which the person of riches leads needs no curse to explain it. So now let's listen to, well, not the whole of immolation scene, because that's 14 minutes, but the last seven minutes of, of this immolation scene.
Thank you, Agnes. Are you, um, is that the end of your introduction? <laughs> that That's the end, yeah. Sorry. Um, I wanted to keep it to what was the original scheduled timing. And, and yes. before anybody asks any questions or if, if anybody wants to do that, can I just say, Tina, that I'm kind of bursting into tears now because this is the first time ever after about 20, 25 present Zoom presentations that my music examples went the way I dreamt about. And that's because of you. And I just can't get over it. So oh, thank you so much. I'm glad it worked all right. I'm really happy. Uh, it was uh, quite the finale, isn't it? It's, a, it's very moving when they all turn around to the audience, doesn't it? And when it works with the music, brilliant. Really, really good. So, um, comrades, if you have any questions, contributions, and um, hopefully those who know more about opera than me uh, could could come in and, and ask though. But in terms of, you know, as a as a socialist and a Marxist, where do you see, if you see it at all, where do you see the interlinking of, you know, I mean, I can see lots of collectivity, and I think that there's a lot of of that happening in opera, isn't it? Where it's sort of you have the people working together to sing and you, you have a sort of sense of solidarity through through the singing and through even when it clashes sometimes it comes together again and it goes apart etc where is it for you the the sort of key you know the as a socialist why are you, are you drawn to to opera you think yeah i'm going to answer in a second it's just i forgot to mention that as someone i think someone called jane mentioned in the chat just when i finished the my text. Yes, the last example was Gwyneth Jones and it was Gwyneth Jones and it was from Byright. So I should have mentioned. So where do I see it? Well, as I was trying to explain in my prepared presentation, there are so many ways one can express the frustration about politics and life and struggle and injustice. And one is opera. And it goes, when it's done well, it goes deep into the heart and the stomach and so on. So sometimes I think that the best way to express all the horrors we live in is through music. Um, it cannot be misunderstood. And yes, it's very much a communal thing. It's very much teamwork. Um, but that's not the main reason why I think that we should go for it and we should cultivate it. And I've been encouraging my pupils over the decades to go to opera, but I didn't just encourage them. I pressurized the Royal Opera House management, the ENO management, that they should give us free tickets because it's their duty, because it's the future, and these children can't afford to come. And kind of I always manage. Um, because then we see all the everything which matters in life, including including politics, um, expressed via music, and everybody should have the right to go and hear it. Absolutely, very well put. It is about human nature, isn't it? The human experience. It's in yes. It, it forms. Okay, Malcolm, please. You need to unmute, comrade. Sorry, you're not quite unmuted. Okay. That's it. <clears throat> I want to say something that's completely against what's been talked about. I would like the um, speaker's view on the idea that what people call uh, maybe serious or classical music is basically a very oppressive music. And this is because it's based on a diatonic scale. And the diatonic scale allows you to play all sorts of music that actually restricts people. So what, I've got, what I'm holding up here, if you can see it, is a blues harp. A blues harp comes in keys. This one is in the key of C. So you can't play a blues harp at a, in the wrong key. So most folk music, which is much more available to people <clears throat> than so-called classical music or learning those sorts of instruments, it's much more accessible because it has much more restricted scales. And this is true, true I think, of most folk music. 
The other thing I wanted to say about the oppressive nature of, of so I mean, everybody who is a sort of virtuoso has spent all their life passing and passing and passing, and to be a virtuoso is completely unavailable, in even playing a musical instrument with any competence is more or less unavailable to everybody. And if you ask people, say, can you sing? Almost everyone will say, no, I've got a terrible voice. Whereas in fact, it's nature from sort of way back that everybody does sing. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to mention is the dictatorship of um, trying to comply with the composer's exact orders. So pieces of music are constantly examined as to what the original composer actually meant and how it should be played. And so there's no freedom whatsoever in so-called serious or classical music for musicians to do anything except to follow orders of the dictator who is the composer. Thank you. Controversial comments right from the start. I like it. Agnes, do you um, have anything to answer to that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, there is no, I mean, you have the freedom to listen or not to listen, so there is no dictatorship. Not the point, no. That's that's one thing. But also, I did mention right at the beginning that um, operas, music theater, were already happening long before the 16th century in China and Japan and South Asia. And there, the music is not tonal system. It's all kind of scales and so on. But, you know, I only had not one uh, presentation to make, and I wanted to focus on Mozart and Beethoven and Wagner because of the actual plot, which I think should appeal to socialists. Yes, singing is the beginning of everything. You, I, I teach everything through singing. Uh, I fully agree. Um, so, and how you read the music, which is on the paper, depends on, from, from artist to artist. One of the things which I'm trying to teach to my pupils is that, now let's look what's not written, what is between the notes. So this is where interpretation comes in. So you have a certain amount of freedom. Anyway, that's my response. Is that okay for you? No? Sorry, Martha, okay. do, you wanna, is, do you think she's answered your questions? Sorry, you're, you're still muted. Sorry, comrade. Um, not really, because my experience of music over many, many years is that, uh, I mean, I once had asked a piano teacher, I said to her, have you ever heard anybody play for you that was correct? Because most piano, most music teachers I've ever had were always, that's wrong. Haven't you seen what the music says? It says you know, double P or playing MF and whatever. And and so it's endlessly, um, endlessly uh, critical in that sense. And you're always trying to achieve, achieve some sort of impossible level of achievement which sort of almost nobody does and the other thing i would well as i'm allowed to talk which is very kind of you um what do you think what do you think about jazz for instance jazz what, yes wonderful you've got the freedom there and i'm so proud to tell you that one of my ex-students who studied with me for like about eight years when a child is one of the best jazz uh, bass players now and he says everything he knows is from me. So yes, wonderful. But this presentation was about opera. I I, I know I'm I know I'm going way off off subject. Yeah, jazz so is a great I genre. Apologize. Great yes. genre, full of freedom, improvisation on some set, huh, on some right. sets. But yes, but okay. I was not trying to persuade comrades that opera has a lot to offer to socialists. I, I do wonder if we could in, in future, uh, you know, dis discuss the session on atonal and tonal music and stuff, which I'm a total novice about, but I've, I've, I've heard bits of it and I find it very interesting. Malcolm, if you are interested and, you know, expert enough on, on that, it might be good to have two hmm. different views and putting forward examples, etc. Hmm. I, I, I teach atonal, 
but this presentation was about opera. <laughs> Well, okay. okay. Interesting. Well, we we'll, we we'll revisit revisit that um because that uh, communist Thanks. socialists should should talk about everything. Okay. Um, we 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 should be, you know, champions of of all questions. Jane, hi. Can you unmute? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, but yes, I am indeed the chair who sent the, the chat about, about Gwyneth Jones in, in, in Cheryl's ring, which do you realise that was actually nearly 50 years ago? Um, and um, it's controversial, it was at the time, it's now become a classic. Now, you see, what I did this evening, I actually stopped listening to the live broadcast of Tristan Isolde from Bayreuth so that I could participate in this discussion. <laughs> you see, um, I got slightly sidetracked by what um, Malcolm said because I also love folk music and there are occasions where I have to be very difficult to decide whether I'm going to go to a folk club or the week more. Anyway, it, it's not relevant, but you see, the thing is that this, although um, there doesn't seem to be an immediate kind of link between opera and folk music, what there is a link is between between folk music and early music, and there's a bit of a sort of overlap because a lot of folk singers like Shirley Collins also perform early music. Um, anyway, um, so, so I just wanted to say that, you see, I, I take your point about that there are people who, who do go to opera to see and be seen, and this is sort of like, to some extent, the case of the Royal Opera House. It was never been the case at English National Opera or um, outside London or in Scotland. And one of the things that I, I don't, I don't live in London anymore, um, but one of the things I miss is all of these weird theatres in Hackney and Islington, um, where you have sort of semi-professional companies doing new works. Um, you know, like, I mean, I uh, Harrison Burtwell is, sat, Burtwell is sadly no longer with us, but he, he, his work would actually sell out at places like the Almeida Theatre. Um, now, there is a problem with, OK, Glyndebourne, for instance, I've never actually been to Glyndebourne, but there are a lot of people who go there for the social cachet and not for the music. Um, I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, and I, I must admit that sometimes at the Royal Opera House, I've got like shouting at people, I'm missing everybody. I live in a council flat in Kilburn, but that might have resulted in me being escorted with the building by security. But I mean, I, I, I was sort of, when I first started going to the opera, I was 13 and I wasn't aware of the, the sorts of social nuances. I went to the opera because I liked opera. Um, and it's expensive. But you sort of factor it in, I suppose. Um, anyway, I just uh, I just I, I I did really think that's fascinating, and it was it was really lovely to see that 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 scene again um, from the ring. And I mean, I just think how how, how brilliantly Shero interpreted it. Um, and yeah, I just finished by saying is I love opera, I love folk music, I love jazz. Anyway, so that, thanks very much. For, for, for your talk, and I, say, I, I did find that what Malcolm said was slightly distracting, so I got a bit sidetracked. Anyway, but I, I think I finished for now. Thank you. Can I just ask you, did you say you were sidetracked because you were also listening to, to Tristan and Isolde from Bayreuth? Yes, this is a live, um, this is a live, um, live relay of Tristan from Bayreuth now. I know, I it's now. happening now. I know. Yeah, right now. And right. I actually sort of switched it off so I could come and participate in this yeah. discussion. Yeah, I, I forgive you because the conductor, Sam Young Bitchkov, is yes. great and I'm sure yeah, it's a great it was, it, I mean, it, it was just so wonderful. What I, did, what I, I mean, I was listening to the radio broadcast rather than the live stream because I couldn't actually access the live stream. But um, I was very happy to be able to hear it. And I think when this is over, I probably will get the last sort of 15 minutes or so. Yeah, thank uh, you thanks. very much for fitting in my talk and <clears throat> at the same time when Samuel Bitchkov contacts Tristan and his older, which I'm sure is wonderful. But there, there is nothing one could say about socialism, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Right. Like, okay. like all genres, some are linked to socialism, aren't they? And, and some aren't. This is actually just a, a, in, the, in the chat. Um, what do you think about that? Is there is there something like highest form of music? you know, a best form or is it just purely subjective? Do you think wh whoever likes whatever music, you know, pop has the same value as, as opera for you? Well, I think any genre is fine if, it, if it's done well. It's, for me, that's the criteria. But again, but again, today my task was to persuade comrades that opera 
can say an awful lot about the issues which we discuss on our weekly meetings, at our weekly meetings, i.e. about life and oppressors and justice and poverty. So that's what I was trying to put forward today, that it's not opera's fault if it's hijacked by the very rich. Mm. Opera still gives us the chance to see, you know, how poor people were in La Boheme and what that American Pinkerton did in Modern Butterfly. So, you know, imperialism, poverty, it's all there in opera. Yeah, thank you. Ken? Very many thanks, Agnes, for your talk, which was fascinating and a great reminder of many great operas that I've, I've seen and listened to over the years. One composer you didn't mention your talk, and I appreciate that within the constraints of the time provided, you can't fall, you know, cover everything, was Verdi in Italy. And I'd be interested in your views on his politics, both before the 1840 revolution, which was, of course, defeated, when his operas were more overtly political and his operas after then, which became much less obviously political. But certainly in operas like Rigoletto, the oppression of the ruler is very much to the fore. And I just wondered what your your own perceptions and reflections on Verdi's operas from the point of view of politics would be. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not a Verdi expert, but um, I think that most of his operas deal with people in courts. And I was trying to um, do examples where, in spite of being, you know, like the count, uh, the count and countess's household, um, and so on. But I was trying to show um, the equality or not equality between servants and 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 the aristocrats and that sort of thing. But I mean, for instance, you mentioned Rigoletto. It is all in the Duke's household. It happens in the Duke's household. And yes, he he is a horrible person, but I don't see. I don't see the socialist uh, context there. So forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, I know Rigolato very well, but I wouldn't be able to present it as, as an example of socialist um, issues. That's what I'm saying. There's a lot of freedom fighting and apparently Nabucco, even already Nabucco was supposed to be like a later time, so the freedom from the oppressor nationalistically, and then one nation occupies the other nation. I think there's a lot of that in Verdi. And I'm just thinking about, I mean, Don Carlos, again, I mean, one, my favorite Verdi opera is Don Carlos, but it's all about the king and the queen. And so I don't know what do you think, Ian? Well, I mean, uh, from my perspective, you're right. Most of Verdi's operas are written from the perspective of a people, the Italians, struggling for independence. Yes. But I think there's also a very strong commentary on the extent to which aristocratic government oppresses people, distorts society, and makes ordinary living impossible. So... Yes, he's less, if you like, overtly socialist than some of the other works we've described. But in his own time, what he was writing against, I would argue, was the system of oppression that was inflicted on the Italian people at the time and ways potentially in which you might fight against it. So, so it's perhaps a more distant relation, but I still think there is a relevance to, to Verdi's work, but that perhaps is the subject for a separate talk, but thank yeah, you. I'm very happy to put together something about Verdi. <laughs> um, I went for the examples which were immediately in my mind when I saw the title about snobism and socialists. <laughs> and, but you are absolutely right, but there was a time limit and I wanted to have a good balance of talk and music and I wanted to have good music. I wanted to have 
the best possible performances which I could find. And yes, you are absolutely right. Yeah. Well, you have to come again, Agnes, don't you? Thank you, Ken. <laughs> well, it's also, I, I think it's good to see, you know, comrades like Ken, he, he listens to Verdi and he thinks of those liberation movements, etc. So it is, you know, everybody takes from whatever, whoever composer they want, they they take the, the, the good message, perhaps, you know, the, what is progressive about it. Sally, hi. Hi, am I on mute or can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you, yeah. Thank you, Agnes. It was lovely to hear your thoughts on those great operas. But I just wanted to pick you up on what you said at the beginning about the accessibility. And I've just been in Birmingham for Birmingham Opera, who were doing New Year by Michael Tippett, his last opera, which is a socialist opera, um, like most of his operas. Um, he was a socialist. And it's done in a big tent and it's a, with a completely amateur orchestra. And I don't care what Malcolm, whoever he is, says, you don't have to do sing exactly what's what's there. None of the people in that chorus had vocal scores. Most of them can't read music. Most of them have not done any singing before, but they learn these complex operas, not just Tippett, but Hovanshina, Lady Macbeth, Macbeth of the Mid-Sense District, um, huge Verdi operas, and they do them from, from memory, and they sing them from the heart. And the audience, it's not in a prosarch, it's in a tent or a, or a factory. And um, they've done Fidelio, a wonderful production of Fidelio. And it doesn't have to be, opera doesn't have to be inaccessible. And indeed, Michael Tippett would have absolutely loved this new year. He would have loved it to be out of the opera house. And um, I just wanted to, you know, also, I thought you might end actually with Ligeti and Le Grand Macabre, which is indeed the end of the world. And also a, a very interesting composer, Hungarian composer. I know. <laughs> yes. Anyway, nice to hear you, Agnes. And, and thank you. Thank you so much for Sally. And I don't know if Ian can still hear me that now that he mentioned Verdi, all of a sudden the Don Carlos music is in my head when oh, the wow. Grand Inquisitor comes oh, the great, great and opera. squashes all the revolutionary people because there's a bit of a revolution in there. And then he comes in and on your knees, on your knees, but it's a bass singer who sings it. And but everybody's frightened and they are back and they are oppressed. So all of a sudden, now all these Wagner scenes come to my mind. But I'm so glad I didn't think of them while I was preparing because then I wouldn't have known how to how to fit it in all <laughs> in the veil at the time. The other great thing is with Verdi is you can sing the tunes. That's a I very know. that's a very leveling thing that everybody can sing those tunes everybody right yep. i can i can see a, a session on verdi coming up thank you thank yeah. you Sally. No, um, i won't be able to sleep because that you on your <laughs> knees on your knees Ugh. um Agnes, can i can i ask you about um sort of the artist and the music because you you made a you made an a, an attempt to you know, look for socialism within within those within those operas or socialistic ideas, etc. And I, I, I appreciate that. But there is a there is a sort of a long standing discussion, of course. You know, sort of can controversial or say let's artists with bad politics can they make good art? You know, that you can look at uh, without thinking about the politics of the of the author. And Wagner is a, is a very good example. I mean, he's highly controversial as i'm sure as i'm sure you know i mean you mentioned he was you know he was a, sort of a supporter of the of the revolutionary upheavals he had to flee germany because he was you know a, a supporter of that but then he also you know was quite the anti-semites he wrote quite a lot of stuff against jewish people etc hitler incorporated him etc you know he was that uh, that was a big thing that um that wagner was incorporated by hitler how do you see that those sort of tensions that that politicians get cooperate incorporated and yeah. not always and they are not always nice nice people but they can still make nice art perhaps yeah unfortunately the, um, the the very very bad people can still very bad human beings can still create great art but I'm just going to immediately um, respond to this Wagner and anti-Semitism. Um, first of all, it's not, I mean, it's my view. It's controversial, but this is my view. 
it's not Wagner's fault that Hitler decided to love Wagner's music. And yes, Wagner did write some not very nice things about Jewish people, but I think he was he was an armchair anti-Semite. I, I mean, the, the person who premiered the Wagner's Parsifal was Hermann Levy, a Jewish conductor. And Wagner asked him to do that. Wagner has chosen Hermann Levy. And Hermann Levy lived in Wagner's house for several weeks when they were preparing it. And Parsifal is the ultimate thing. It's all about Christianity and the Aryan people and all that. But in spite of that, it was Hermann Levy who was chosen to conduct. And he and Hermann Levy also conducted performances of, of the ring. So uh, I'm Jewish, I'm a Holocaust survivor, and I just love Wagner's music. People are complex. Yeah. And, I, and you know, anti-Semitism at that time was so common, it wasn't just a Nazi thing, was it? Yeah. And he never suggested he he never, never suggested that let's have some genocide of whether Jews or Palestinians. He was just making nasty comments mm. in his writing. Now, I wish he wouldn't have done it, but also probably he was a bit jealous because of Mayabai was very successful and this sort of thing. So no, I wish he wouldn't have done it. And no, he wasn't a very pleasant person. And in spite of this anti-capitalist piece, this monumental ring cycle, he was a very happy capitalist. <laughs> he, he lived very well and he exploited Ludwig, whatever his name was, the, the king of Bavaria. And so he was a complex character. Thank Is you. that okay? As a... Yeah, no, I think that's that's what humans are, aren't we? <laughs> we are we are all quite we all live in capitalism for a start, you know, that makes us as as socialists quite quite complicated and have to have a bourgeois job, etc. Um Ian. Oh, absolutely thank you so much, Agnes. Absolutely brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I mean oh. in Coming as I did from a sort of London working class background, the, the idea of going to opera as a, as a boy wouldn't have crossed my mind. <clears throat> when I went to university, um, I remember one of my lecturers sort of saying about how uh, Mozart despised the aristocracy. I and mean, this comes across in, in his operas all the time. Uh, and the idea that opera could have this radical content didn't cross my mind until I, until I went to university. And then it opened up a whole new world, really. Um, the other thing about opera, uh, which I've grown to love, is, is its enormous flexibility and, and its capacity to reinvent itself in different ways. Um, I became very fond of uh, John Gay's Beggar's Opera. And I have a number of different versions of, of that opera. And here you have the most biting political satire of the day. I mean, there are characters in there. Um, so, for example, at one point, um, uh, McHeath, uh, sorry, uh, Peachum uh, talks about Bob Booty. Now, everyone would have known, everyone in the audience at that time would have known that Bob Booty that was being referred to was the current Prime Minister of the day, Robert yes. Walpole, who was known to be a, somebody who accepted bribes from the most um, criminal where people go in and the whole story is about how the rich get away with it and the poor get punished uh, for for really quite minor offenses and so uh, it, and it ties in with my love of the artist Hogarth as well um the other thing about it I mean the way in which it can even be reinvented in a, in a contemporary milieu so the rock opera Tommy uh, and Quadrophenia by The Who, I've had a lifelong love of as well. Um, it's not that I'm suggesting that uh, one genre is better than another, but I do think there is some value in um, having, having great art that can work on a whole range of different levels. Um, of course, the other thing about opera is, is the way in which it can adapt what else is out there. So 
the number of great operas that have been derived from Shakespeare plays, for example, I think is a fantastic feature of, of the genre. So but thank you very much. Uh, it's been a fabulous evening. And um, just that, really. Gosh, I'm so honored because I've been listening to you week after week after week after week. And so from you, um, you know, a praise is like I'm going to, that's the second time I'm going to burst into tears. <laughs> Just going back very quickly, yes, the the Beggar's Opera, and you say opera can be reinvented. As I mentioned in my presentation, Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill did reinvent the Beggar's Opera of John Gray, and as the, and it became the Three Penny Opera or Drei Groschen Opera. Um, so yes, it can be reinvented. The, the music basically came from folk music in the Beggar's Opera. So Kurt Weill then did his bit. And that was the modern version, then modern version of the Beggar's Opera. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you very much, comrades. Thank you very much, Agnes. We have no more um, comments, uh, but it's, it is um, almost nine o'clock. So thank you very much. I think, though, I mean, if you if you're up for it, you know, I think you have so much knowledge on on these various issues. It would be great to if you have any other suggestions for other sessions after our summer break in in September. Would be very pleased to have you back on. Wow. Show with yeah. Sessions. Thank you. And by the way, thank you for giving me this opportunity, um, which only came up because when I saw this sentence. Socialist snobs opera. I thought, what? <laughs> yeah, it came uh, about somebody was planning a session and then had to yeah. drop out, and you said, "Yeah, I'm interested in doing it." So yeah, because <laughs> I wanted to object. <laughs> <laughs> Good, and you did very well as well. So thank you very much, comrade, bringing us, uh, you know, in contact with with a, 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 an area of of music that not all. Um, uh, socialists are of faith with us. Thank you very much, comrade. And we're hoping to to have more um, of you soon. Comrades, thank you for an interesting discussion and an interesting night on, on two subjects that I know knew very little about. So I, I consider myself uh, much better informed than I was at the beginning of the evening. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Paul. Good night, comrades. Thank you so well, much. We'll be Goodbye. back in September. As I said, we have a, we have a, a few weeks off in, in August. Enjoy your holiday or if you're going away, enjoy your summer break. And we'll see you back in September. Good night, comrades. Thank you so much. Good night.